Our first speaker is Dr. Joe Palmer. He's a South Carolina dentist, went to the South Carolina School of Dentistry, graduated in 1982. Uh, I went to the Middle University of South Carolina. Whatever. Whatever. That's, That's different. different. South Carolina. I'll flip it down, down after getting talks. Clemson. Clemson. Um, he, uh, he's, he's been a member since 2001. He is our past treasurer. treasurer. He, he received his mastership this past year. Uh, and he's, he's going to talk to you all about Mercury 101. So, Dr. Dr. Joe Palmer. When I started in the dentistry, I graduated in 1983. And I was practicing Mercury dentistry. I mean, just like I was taught, putting it in, taking it out. And my, my wife, wife was, was my first dental assistant, assistant for about, about six, six months. months. She, she worked six months. months. Um, I actually, actually I got, got out of school, school. Um, I, I went, went three, three and a half year program, program got out, I mean four year program, program I got out three and a half. She, she quit, quit her job teaching in Charleston, which was really stupid because they had no income. income. And, and we, we moved, moved to Piedmont, South, South Carolina, a little mill town, town, opened up practice. So, so we weren't that busy, but we didn't have any money. And she worked for me for six months, and during that six months she had a miscarriage, and then she stayed home. Came, came back, back in the office, office a little bit and helped at the front, front desk. desk. And, and the reason that's significant, because uh, two, two years later, she was having symptoms of, uh, of fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia, the doctors told her. And, and I, I said, said, you don't have fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia. nobody, nobody knows, knows what that is. That's, that's, they're just labeling you. And, and I, I sent her to this pain specialist that was helping me do some TMD stuff, and he diagnosed her with heavy metal toxicity. So that, that was, was my first exposure. exposure. But of course, I was pretty stupid. I didn't, I didn't connect that that mercury was, was coming from the dental, dental practice until maybe, maybe 10, ten years later, later and, and I started, started getting mean as a hornet. My personality was changing. Every, Every joint in my body hurt. At, At the end, end of the day, I couldn't move my right thumb from, from using a hypodermic syringe, and I was one of the first persons in South Carolina to buy a wand because I couldn't push that hypodermic needle. And Marcy, Marcy finally came to me, my wife, and said, Joe, you've you got, got to do something. Something, something, something is wrong with you. We're, We're going to stay married. married. you, you got to get, get fixed. fixed. I, I had mercury poisoning. poisoning. Very, very high levels. And, and so, so I had to go through chelation, chelation treatment for uh, the, the first, first time around, uh, about, about six months, and, and we cut it down about half. It wasn't that great, great but it was, I, was I was doing, doing better. better. And, and then, then I kept, kept on keeping, keeping on in the industry. I, I didn't have met this group yet. yet. And, and then, then luckily, I finally met this group. And, and finally came, came to a meeting and, and sat out there where, where you are and, and figured out what I had to do to, to quit being exposed, exposed to mercury every day. So I had, I had to go through chelation twice. I just, just reinfected myself. myself. The, the second time, it took two years to get, get my levels down. down. And my, my levels, levels were really high. high. They were like 85 for the number. number. Uh, and I, I got, got it down below three. But, but it's, it's still, still in there. It's caused a lot of damage. damage. I've, I've had problems from it. I've had two heart attacks. attacks. I've got diabetes. Um, that's, that's about it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't hurt, hurt anymore. anymore. I'm, I'm back to my old pleasant self. self. I, don't I don't cuss people out just for looking at me, you know, like I used to. So life's a lot better. Thanks to this organization, really. So I'm very passionate <clears throat> about you, you hearing, hearing this message. message. You're, You're all young. You've got, got a lot of females out there. <clears throat> this, this is really serious stuff. You need, need to go back and start, start putting this place, place tomorrow. tomorrow. Some of you probably, probably already have. I assume, assume somebody's, somebody's in here part of accreditation. How many people are trying, trying to get accredited? So, so you, are, you already know all of this. You're here to take the course. course. Uh, others, it may be your first time hearing this. And um, you, you will see that I'm pretty passionate, passionate about, about it, and it's, it's, it's what, what you're, you're supposed to be doing, doing is what you're going to hear. So, what, what is, is this stuff? Why is it so bad for us? <clears throat> well, it's in the material you use. It's in the amalgam. It's 50% mercury. And then the other metals, and you probably remember this from dental school, because there's silver, copper, tin, and zinc. We came out with high copper alloys when I was in school, which is supposed to be a better alloy, which shrink less, blah, blah, blah. It also releases mercury easier. 
And then, you know, you triturate it in that little machine, and it spreads all over the office when you do that. It doesn't stay in those capsules. And it's the reason that this organization exists and the reason we need to be biological dentists because we don't need to use this stuff and we need to protect ourselves and our patients when we're taking it out. So you'll hear dentists, they'll be, <clears throat> maybe in their advertisements, they might say, I'm mercury free. Well, a lot of young dentists, and I expect a lot of y'all, maybe never even placed an amalgam after you got out of school. And that's great. But did you do it safely? Because there's a difference in being mercury free and mercury safe. safe. A lot, a lot of guys, guys out there are mercury free, free. They, they have no clue, clue the contamination they're causing to their, to their bodies and their patients' bodies, bodies when they take the stuff out of people's mouths. So, so mercury safe means using some pretty rigorous safety measures that I'm going to go over here in a little bit to mitigate your mercury exposure. So you're not exposed, so your patient's not exposed. So you can safely do this without getting sick from your profession. And you'll hear patients have come up with a term, I think, biological dentist, or holistic, holistic dentist. dentist. And you, you would assume, assume anybody that says they're a biological dentist is going to be a mercury safe dentist. dentist. And, and they, they could, could go into further things, things, things that may seem wacko and weird, weird right now if you're first getting into this organization. organization. Things, things that I thought were just like, like man, who, who are these crazy, crazy people? <clears throat> uh, I, I took Phil Malika's biological, biological dental, dental course, and, and it's a great course. I'm sure you're here about it today. It doesn't teach you anything about dentistry. It, it teaches you how the human, human body works. It's going, going back to those classes, classes we had to take with the med students. And it, it just goes, goes over that, but it really explains how they work. work. And I never talk about these things called the meridians, meridians, the acupuncture points. points. Meridians, meridians start, start with the teeth, teeth, they go out all throughout the body. They've been mapped out by the Chinese for centuries. So I had an uh, anterior tooth that had a root canal when I was about... Uh, <clears throat> That must have been about 30. I got hit by a car when I was 16. Broke it and finally died. I walked out the door to the office one day and said, oh, locked the door. I said, dang, my tooth's hurting. Of course, I went to the endodontist. I got a root canal, put the bleach in. It was the worst thing I've ever had done to me was putting bleach in your tooth. And I had a root canal until I had it taken out because when we got combium x-rays, guess what it had on it? A huge abscess. My left ankle had been hurting for a couple of years, and I walk when I play golf, and it got to the point where the last four or five holes I'd limp playing golf. We did everything to it. MRIs, injected it, ozone, corticosteroids, everything you would do, couldn't find anything wrong with that ankle. So when I was taking the course, we found this abscess. I said, Phil, you got to take my tooth out. So I went up early to his office and for the course, took my tooth out. And Phil was I was in the chair, and I was sitting there, and my ankle quit hurting. I said, Phil, did you just get that tooth out? He said, yeah, I just took it out. He said, why? I said, my ankle quit hurting. Hadn't hurt since. I said, okay, I'm a believer. <laughs> this stuff is real. This stuff is real, we're going to tell you today. today. You, you may, may think, think it's, it's weird and wacky, wacky but, but it is real. real. <clears throat> so, so our, our friend, friend Mercury is, is a heavy, heavy metal. metal. Atomic, atomic number, number is 80 with a weight, weight of whatever, whatever that is. And it's, it's the only metal that's a liquid at room temperature. temperature. It's it's a, it puts off vapor gas, gas constantly. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what temperature it is. You, you can't freeze the stuff. It's going to put off gas. gas. And, and the, the hotter it gets, the more, more it vaporizes. So, so you, you drink hot coffee, you stimulate, stimulate it with a toothbrush, it puts, puts off more vapor. The World Health Organization talks, talks about, about mercury. mercury. One, One thing, thing they say is there's no level of mercury that's safe. And, and you can see it has all kind of harmful effects. effects. It's a neurotoxin. It causes problems with the nervous system. It can cause depression. It can cause changes in personality like it was doing to me. It affects digestive, res respiratory system. It affects your immune systems. It goes into kidneys and it can cause lung damage. Basically, it can hurt every organ and it disrupt every enzyme system in the body. A good friend of mine is a dentist, and uh, he's, he's finally joined this organization. We've done all kind of stuff together, LVI, just everything. Our kids were in school together. But he never started practicing Mercury Safe, even though I'd tell him, I told him, and you need to do this. Playing golf one day, his blood pressure went up to like 250 over 200. 
rushed him to the hospital. Couldn't figure out what was causing it until they finally located his kidneys were failing. So they got him through that little episode. He went uh, about five more years, and he just had a kidney replacement like two months ago. He had to have a kidney transplant. Finally got him tested for mercury. Guess what? His mercury levels were sky high. The, the doctors won't get it, but that, that mercury, mercury probably damaged, damaged his kidneys. kidneys. Now, now his, his problem is, when you, you do chelation, chelation you, you take a drug, drug that forces mercury, mercury to come out through the kidneys, kidneys when, when it's supposed, supposed to come out in your feces and your sweat, or your hair. You can be positive in your hair. But it's going to be hard to chelate and clean him up because his kidneys are damaged, and now he's got an extra kidney that's, that he's got to take care of. So I don't know. He's probably just going to have to live with his mercury levels. And, uh, but he is now using safe techniques, so, so finally. finally. He needs, he needs quick drugs, drugs, but, but finally. finally. <clears throat> so, so where, where do we, we get, get exposed, exposed to mercury? mercury? Well, most, most of it's from our mouths. mouths. When people have dental amalgams, the largest exposure to mercury that the population gets. A little bit from fish and seafood, and you hear fish warnings and all this stuff, and that's mainly uh, probably pushed by the ADA so they don't get focused on the mercury in people's mouths. But the mercury in fish is bound to cysteine. The fish bind it to their skin mainly so it doesn't hurt the fish. That's why the fish are swimming around. They're fine. They have natural protection from the stuff. And that's a pretty hard, pretty hard bond to break. So the mercury from fish is not that big a deal. I'm not telling you to go out and eat tuna every day, but if you want to have tuna once a month or occasionally, you're going to be fine doing that. So the biggest exposure is from dental amalgams. <clears throat> The history of this stuff was, because it's been done for like 200 years, two brothers from Germany brought this stuff over in the 1850s. And at that time, we had like two dental schools, and the organized dentistry was called the American Society of Dental Surgeons. And they went crazy. They said, you can't be putting mercury in people's mouths. You know what it does to the hatters? They go crazy. So we had this group of dentists that were graduating from dental schools, that said no, they made their members sign a pledge not to use mercury. And then we had this other group of yeah, dentists so that were the barber, barber dentists. dentists. That's, That's where, where people, people went, got, got their teeth, teeth pulled. pulled, maybe a gold filling if they could afford it. And they were just kind of out here and they weren't really educated, but they had learned how to do dentistry. So organized dentistry hadn't really formed yet. So it caused a big fraction in the group. Some of the people left the American side dental surgeons because they wanted to do mercury. And lo and behold, what did they do? They founded the American Dental Association. So, in 1859, it was, it was founded to do mercury dentistry, and it still can't change its mind today. <clears throat> so the hat makers who used mercury went mad during the felting process, and that, that's where the term mad as a hatter came from, and they banned hat making banned the use of mercury in 1941. But the dental societies still back the use of mercury. Other things that have happened along with the controversy of using mercury, in 1984, the National Institute of Dental Research and the ADA acknowledge mercury might be released from amalgam fillings. What they really should say is vapors is released. The mercury vapor is released from amalgam fillings. Vapor vapor is is but, but they, 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 they say, say that, that today, but they say, oh, it's not, not enough, enough to hurt you. You, you know, know, it's just, just a little bit of vapor, a little bit of mercury, mercury every, every day, day, every breath, but it's not enough to hurt you. You talk to most of the members of this organization, there's enough evidence in this organization that it will hurt you. A lot of people came here, got sick first. In 1986, they, the ADA enacted a resolution that prohibits us from removing mercury fillings for toxicological reasons. And it's still in their codes today, although they're not really after us like they were. You're pretty safe from most dental boards as long as you're smart and don't antagonize another dentist or make false claims in ads. You, they're probably going to leave you alone. Most, it's pretty accepted now that mercury, people want their mercury fillings out. In 2009, the FDA Center for Devices and Radiation Health officially classified dental amalgam fillings as a class two device, which is not a good thing. They basically just grandfathered mercury in. It's never had any safety studies from the FDA. It was just 
always used, so they just grandfathered it in. There's no, no safety study has ever been done on mercury. And it'd be really hard to do it. Because when you're dealing with the second most poisonous substance to man, it'd be hard to prove it's safe to put it in your body. In fact, it'd be impossible. <clears throat> and then in 2017, the EPA standards finally went into effect to limit our discharges from our offices. So now you are required by law, I think in October in South Carolina, <clears throat> to have uh, amalgam separators on, in your sewer system between between your chairs and the, your sewer system, you have to have amalgam separators now. And we'll talk a little bit about, about those. <clears throat> the United Nations had a big uh, environmental program met for years to try to develop a global treaty to protect human health and environment from adverse effects of mercury. It wasn't all about mercury, it was about everything environmental. And this organization and other organizations, IBDM and some other organizations, sent representatives to make sure mercury got included in this treaty. Uh, it has been ratified and in the United States, and I think that's probably why the EPA finally moved on the separators. Because in ratification, you're supposed to be able to do a couple of things to mitigate mercury, and the United States said, we'll just do separators and that'll take care of us in this treaty. They're not going to come out and ban mercury like we wish they would. <clears throat> now, in Europe, um, some countries have banned the use of mercury in Finland. It's Norway and Sweden is no longer in use. Uh, Japan, Finland, and Netherlands are phasing it out. European Union and wherever that place is, I don't know, Mauritius, uh, it's banned from use in children. Denmark is only down to about 5% of restorations. Germany, about 10%. Bangladesh is phasing it out. India, dental schools are required to eliminate amalgam in favor of mercury free alternatives. In Nigeria, they're printing consumer information and about mercury free alternatives to amalgam. And in Canada, has recommended dentists not use amalgam for children for a long time in pregnant women or persons with kidney disorders. If you look at the stuff, the directions that come in, your, in the mercury can when you order it, it says you should do it with protection, and you probably ought to limit it in children and pregnant people. It says that in the directions. <clears throat> so the European Union ruled as of July 1st, 2018, that dental amalgam should not be used in in deciduous teeth, or in children under 15 years age, or in pregnant or breastfeeding women. And then their feasibility of a phase out in 2030. I don't think these people realize how easy it is to phase out dental amalgam. Let me tell you how I did it. In 1995, I heard uh, Dr. Bill Strupp. I don't know if anybody knows, y'all are so young, I don't know if you know who Bill Strupp is. But he's a very, very good restorative dentist. He's down in Florida. And this was um, 95, you know, CERIC was coming out. We were getting to use bonded restorations of porcelain. He was mainly PFM guy, gold guy. He hated dental amalgam. He literally, for two days, lectured on restorative techniques. And this was the days of slides, guys. Anybody know what slide is? A real slide, a projector carousel? The back of the room, about like this, was stacked up with slides as high as you could reach them all the way across. I mean, he must have had cases of slides. And by the time I left that meeting, I was like nauseated when I saw him out and feeling. He called them black crud, all the stuff that was under them, how they were cracking teeth. It's a lousy restorative material. What it was doing to teeth, not one word about mercury, because I don't think he knew. So I walked back in my office from that meeting on Monday morning, and I was trying not to do them anyway, but I still had an office. And I walked in, and I said, girls, in the South, we call them girls. <laughs> I said, girls, get all the amalgam, get it out of this office, get the triturators where I can't see them. I'm not going to ever do another amalgam. And I had this little country girl who worked for me, good Christian. She babysat my kids since she was 12 years old. I never heard her say anything. She, she said, it's about damn time. <laughs> I 
That's how easy it is to stop doing mercury. That's how easy it is to start protecting yourself too. You go back and you do it. So what happens to all this mercury vapor you're exposed to, the patient's exposed to? 80% of it that you breathe in is absorbed in the lungs, then is spread throughout the body. It can go to the brain, the kidney, the liver, the lung, the gastrointestinal tract. It goes all over the place. The half-life of the metallic mercury depends on the organ it's in and where it's deposited. And for example, the half-life of mercury in the whole body and kidney regions has been estimated at 58 days. But in the brain, it can have a half-life of up to several decades. I don't know how they measure that, but it can really cause some damage. <clears throat> so mercury likes uh, sulfur groups. It loves them. And a lot of your enzymes, the key if you kind of remember your basic biochemistry, they always explain to me like a lock and key. And you had to have something that comes and binds to a sulfur group that turns that enzyme on. Well, mercury loves the stuff, and it, went, it will bind to that sulfur group, and then whatever key is supposed to unlock that enzyme can't unlock that enzyme. So it can affect and disrupt all the enzyme, enzymatic systems in your body. That's why you feel tired. That's why you may have brain fog. Causes inflammation, makes your joints hurt. Chronic fatigue, it can get all the way down and affect the mitochondria, which don't make enough energy, so you're tired all the time. So you've got all these symptoms that can be contributed to mercury. It can cause it. There's other things that can cause them too. So mercury is so ubiquitous in destroying different parts of the body is one reason the medical profession hasn't said that's, called, that's caused by mercury. It's really just hard to prove because it can do all these various and different things. You'll have patients that will, their most common complaint when they come in is they'll say, I'm tired all the time. They'll say, I'm forgetting things. I have brain fog. They'll say, I have brain fog. They'll go into parts of the body that hurt. Those are the three most common things that I, I see them say. Headaches can be caused by mercury. And they, headaches can also be caused by the mix of metals in people's mouth from galvanism. Um, they'll have psychological issues, depression. Dentists still have a high rate of suicide. Probably because mercury has a role in that, causing depression, affecting their brains. Did I miss a slide? No, took one out. Good. Okay. So it's a neurotoxin, a known neurotoxin. Um, and the toxic effects can be different in different individuals. It's going to attack the weakest part of the body. You can see one or, or a combination of symptoms that can be present, and they may change over time. It can take many years for symptoms to manifest. This is a chronic Exposure, slow exposure. When it builds up, when the bucket gets full enough, the body can't take it anymore, you're going to start seeing chronic disease. And you're not really going to see an acute mercury poison. You don't see that very often. You've got to have a lot big exposure at one time to see acute mercury poison cases. That's probably something that's more likely going to have in a manufacturing accident if somebody gets exposed. But one thing about manufacturing facilities that use mercury in the manufacturing process, guess what they have to do? They have to monitor the whole time. There's the levels of mercury vapor. And the workers have to wear protective clothing when they're around the room that that mercury vapor might be in. Dentistry, we can run the levels up high enough to close down a manufacturing plant taking out just a couple of restorations. But we're not required to monitor, and we're not required to wear protective clothing. <clears throat> now we've got, there's scientific papers that have linked mercury to all of these conditions. Allergies, antibiotic resistance, look at the neuro uh, diseases. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease autoimmune disorders that affect 
the nervous system, all of those. Kidney disease, um, lichen planus. You can see lichen planus go away when you get the metals out of people's mouth. Psychological issues such as depression and anxiety, uh, reproductive dysfunction. Um, studies that have looked at the um, pregnancy rates of dental assistants, you know, they have higher numbers of miscarriages and um, harder to get, harder to have babies to get pregnant than the, if you compare it to the general population. <clears throat> so how much mercury is released from these fillings? Well, this is a, a slide showing that, um, let's see how this thing works. This is amalgam. This is mercury vapor coming off the amalgams. Constantly releasing the mercury vapor. All right. So all mercury silver fillings leak substantial amounts of mercury constantly. The amount increases with any kind of stimulation, and as a result, mercury from fillings produces the majority of human exposure to mercury. The International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology is extremely concerned about the anecdotal claims of safety by manufacturers and dental trade associations. Their are at variance with the published, peer-reviewed scientific evidence to the contrary. The precautionary principle requires action once the possibility of harm exists. It does not require proof beyond a shadow of a doubt that in the case of heavy metal and xenobiotic exposure is both nearly impossible and unnecessary in our opinion. What you're seeing is mercury vapor coming off a 25-year-old silver amalgam filling in an extracted tooth. The background is a phosphorescent screen. The mercury vapor absorbs the fluorescent light, and you can see it as a shadow on the screen. This is mercury coming off a filling that was dipped in water that's the same temperature as the human body. This is a filling that was rubbed with a pencil eraser for just a few seconds like going to the hygienist and having her clean your teeth. These are not small amounts of mercury. If you can see it, it's more than 1,000 times higher than the Environmental Protection Agency will allow for the air that we breathe. What about the last time you went to the dentist and they drilled on your tooth? Here is the mercury vapor every time you raise the temperature to 110 degrees with hot coffee or warm water, or even chewed on it. Mercury comes off fillings every time you stimulate them, and that simulation causes the mercury to continue to leak out of the fillings for an hour and a half, at a minimum. Some people grind their teeth. Some people chew gum. That was uh, Dave Kennedy's voice, who I'm sorry y'all not going to get to see. Uh, his doc Dave is close to 80, if he's not 80, and he still flies his own plane to meetings, and the doctor told him this week he couldn't fly for some reason. I haven't, haven't found out why, but he's uh, one of the most brilliant, um, been one of my mentors over the years, and the man is just brilliant. He's got a brain that will shock you. He can quote studies, dates, where they were published, out of his head, thousands of them. I mean... It's just crazy how smart the guy is. So I'm sorry you're going to miss him. You get, to look, you get to look at Griffin. He looks better than David, but he's not as smart. <laughs> he's smart, but he's not as smart as David. All right, so these are all published estimates of mercury exposure in adults with dental mercury fillings. And you can see they're pretty much, um, pretty much all, all over the place. I mean, they're high, not, but they're all restorations are high. But this guy, oops, wrong way. Dr. Uh, Vimy and Lorsch, and this, Dr. Vimy was uh, one of the original founders of this organization. He's a, uh, they did this up at the University of Calgary in Canada in 1990. This data is from the famous sheep, or the infamous sheep study. Now, when I was in, uh, well, I was out of dental school, it was about seven years. So when they did this, but I remember the ADA came out and said this all, this is hocus pocus stuff, it's all quackery. But what they did is they took 
amalgam and made a radioisotope and put it in the amalgam. So amalgam's not radioactive in, the, in nature. They had to make it radioactive. And they put it in sheep, in their teeth. And they let the sheep eat and chew for a little bit. I don't remember how much time, maybe a month. And then they sacrificed the sheep and they looked to see where all, they did body scans and to see where the mercury was. Well, it was everywhere. It was in, the sheep have two stomachs. It was in their stomachs. It was in the heart. It was in the lungs. It was in their kidneys. Concentrated in the jaw. And um, they distracted the teeth, so the teeth were no longer in there, so it was just in the jaw. So the ADA said, well, that's just, sheep don't chew like people. That doesn't happen in people, because sheep chew differently. So they said, okay, we'll do it in monkeys. So they did the same thing in monkeys and got the same results. And the ADA just said, you know, not true, doesn't happen. That's one of the uh, more famous studies that goes around. But all these other studies have shown that when you chew, the vapor release goes up. And it lasts at those levels for about an hour. When you're at rest, it's a little lower. But as soon as you put your teeth together, which is what, every time you swallow? more mercury vapor is released. A couple of fillings uh, can release up to 50 to 100 micrograms a day exposure to mercury vapor. So Dr. Mark Richardson did a risk assessment study and he said that more than 67 million Americans aged two years and older exceed the intake of mercury vapor considered safe by the U.S. EPA due to their mercury fillings. Over 122 million Americans see the intake of mercury vapor considered safe by the California EPA. And I don't think we have this other study, so I'm not Dave Kennedy, but there's another study that shows that women of childbearing age have enough mercury contamination that their babies can have learning disabilities due to the level of mercury in their body. So the individual response turns on the number of amalgam fillings, the length of time they've been in the mouth, if you have metal allergies, your selenium levels, they get methylated within the body, all these things. If you consume milk and alcohol, maybe that was my problem, wasn't the milk. So genetic predisposition to it. If you have the right genes, the stuff's not going to hurt you. You, you could be the, you know, the 90-year-old that smokes and drinks and does everything else, and she's just doing fine and healthy. And you can be a dentist that excretes mercury at a very high rate so it doesn't stay in your body. And we know the genetics that, that help you excrete it and the genetics that help you hold on to it. So every dentist doesn't get sick. <clears throat> if you have mercury along with lead, other metals, it increases the toxic dose to them. This slide is really hard to see, but that's, a, uh, that's showing a nucleus, that's a cell over there, if you can't tell what that is, and that's the mitochondria, the nucleus of the cell, and how the mercury can, can kind of get in there, and I know you can't read that because I can't read it, but there's lead, arsenic, and mercury in here, and that's the ones you see that kind of run together. If you do a toxic, if you do a Screening test or, or test to find out what heavy metals you have. These three usually show up together. Usually mercury will be the highest. Lead and the arsenic will make the mercury worse. And as you got to peel the mercury out before you can get these two out. And I'm not sure where the arsenic comes from. Arsenic, uh, my wife was high in arsenic. I was high in arsenic. And the, the, the doctor who treated us said it came from, comes from car exhaust and also from uh, chicken. That some companies will use arsenic to make the chicken last longer and not turn colors when it's in the shelves. So when you're buying chicken, you should buy organic chicken and stuff that hadn't been on antibiotics and never says they don't have arsenic, but that doesn't have arsenic in it. <clears throat> so other scientific research has shown the increased number of maternal mercury fillings increases the mercury levels in the fetus and in the infants. The more mercury you have, and the mother has in the mercury fillings, the more mercury you'll see in breast milk. So risk assessment should take size of available children into account, but they typically do not do that. So we don't really look at the kids in these risk assessment things. The children's amalgam trial that the ADA was in on, um, 
there were two studies conducted between 1997 and 2005. They, they stuck mercury in the fillings in these teeth, in children's teeth, and then followed them to see what kind of adverse health effects you have. How in the world did anybody allow them to do that? You know, you're supposed to have these boards if you're doing human studies that keep this type of stuff from happening. But evidently, this, this board didn't. Um, and originally, they said, oh, everybody's doing great, not causing any harm. And then other researchers took their data and reviewed it and said, y'all are leaving stuff out. You've, you've skewed this data. You're not reporting what's really happening. And they have demonstrated that there are long-term effects and that it was based on genetic predis predisposition somewhat with the kids and that they were seeing um, studies, problems based on, a lot of it based on gender. It hurt boys more than girls. And they saw kidney problems. Um, that was the biggest thing that, that they picked up was some kidney dysfunctions in these kids. So the original researchers came back and said, oh, you're right, we agree with you. So completely reversed the results of the study from being safe to showing that it does cause harm in children. <clears throat> so this was the quotes that showed up in the news in 2016 about the children's amalgam trial. And Dr. Echeverria discussed a lifetime risk of neurological damage from dental mercury related to specific genetic variants and noted we're not talking about a small risk. And Dr. James Wood stated that 25 to 50 percent of people have the genetic variants that will really make mercury more damaging. Or they can't get rid of it. So the other factors we have when we put mercury in somebody's mouth is we probably got some other metals in there along the way. Or even two mercury fillings side by side don't have the exact same composition uh, of metals and they will cause a direct current in the mouth. You'll turn the mouth into a battery. It's called galvanism. You got everything in there you need. You got two metals, you got positive and negative charges, and you got saliva. And if again, you look at the directions, they come in an amalgam package, it says do not use them for core buildups and put a metal type crown on top of them. But how many, everybody probably in here was taught that that's okay in dental school, right? How many dentists prep full crowns, got an amalgam in it, leave it in there, put a, put a PFM right on top of it? it causes galvanism. Can cause headaches. You, you get all the metals out of people's mouth, a lot of times their headaches will go away. It's amazing. The brain works on microamperage, and these are measurable currents, a lot higher than what the brain and the body's uh, electrical currents can be measured at. You can also be allergic to dental mercury. Uh, 21 million Americans are probably allergic to metal and have metal allergies. We don't test for metal allergies on our dental patients. Uh, well, some of you might. I mean, we can, but most of us don't because we're not using metal. Health conditions linked to dental metal allergies include autoimmune disorders, fatigue, the same symptoms that come with heavy metal toxicity. Multiple chemical sensitivities, uh, lichen planus, and infertility. A number of patients with health conditions linked to dental metal allergies improve or recover after safe filling removal. And usually if they do, that's probably due to the effect of oral galvanism, to the effect of the currents on the meridians of the body, which are our electrical circuits, which I know that sounds a little woo-woo, but when you take out tooth number nine and your ankle quits hurting and it's on that meridian, it kind of makes a believer out of you. So how do we test for these things? Um, that's tough. I mean, we have a couple tests, and I thought, Janet, do you know, can you still get these tests? The Melissa test? You can? I don't know where to get them, so we'll find out for you, because uh, I just don't know where you get them anymore. The, the, my source quit doing them that I used to use it on, and I hadn't found another source, but I probably haven't been listening or sleeping in class or something. <laughs> they didn't get to get the data. But the lymphocyte transformation test and the MELISA test and the lymphocyte response assay test, these are two tests that actually test for metal allergies. And if you know, if you got somebody that's uh, worried about a titanium implant, 
I'm trying to see if titanium's on there. I don't see titanium on there, so I don't know if it covers titanium. Uh, but it covers all the other metals that are in the body. There are other tests we use, other dental compatibility testing that you take some serum and send it in and they, they test, evaluate it for antibodies to every dental product out there. It's crazy. And you get a detailed list of what a patient should be okay for or what they're unsatisfactory for. And one of these tests is a Clifford test and the other one, where does that slide go? Is on there. The Clifford test and um, the other one, which is Blanche Grubb's test, the company she owns. What's that one called, Janet? Yeah, that Blanche, it is Blanche Grubb's company. She, she, she'll be lecturing to y'all tomorrow on, uh, in the, on root canals, toxins and found in root canals, and she'll tell you about her company. Those two are the ones you can use to find out what materials are safe for your patients. And I don't routinely do this um, because I've seen so many of them come back and the materials we're using are very seldom a problem for a patient. But some patients are going to request to do it, and if they want to do it, fine. If they want to spend the money, it's a good tool to have. Bi yeah, biocomp, somebody like biocomp uh, is the other testing part. So, I mean, we use VOCO composites, which uh, don't have uh, bisphenol A's in them, and we use porcelain, different porcelains. Uh, I've been a CERT doctor since 97, so we use uh, all the porcelains that you can use in the, in the CERT machine, which goes up to Emax, or you, and we'll use zirconia crowns if we need something from a lab. So that's how we restore stuff. We're, we, just, we don't use metal anymore. <clears throat> All right, so as a dentist and as a biological dentist, or when you start safely protecting your patients, they'll come out of the woodwork to find you, I promise you. Um, I do not treat their mercury toxicity. I guide them, I tell them where to go. I may do a screening test. And I have doctors, integrative health doctors, which is great, this meeting, they're, they're going to be here. Um, they treat the mercury toxicity. You're getting outside the scope of your license if you, quote, unquote, tell them you're going to chelate them. And you could get in trouble with state boards for that. I do use some products, which actually will help start to clean them up as part of my protection protocol, and I'll go over that when we get to that part. So what can you do to help these patients and test? Um, here's the, the issue that comes up. Chelation is expensive. Getting your mercury out is expensive. Sometimes they can't do it all at once. Um, this seems like to me it's kind of a waste to be going through chelation, spending a bunch of money when you're just pumping it back right back in from your teeth. You know, the mercury needs to go. It can be done at the same time. But you better get the biggest source you can see if you're going to spend all that money chelating somebody. So we use doctors. Like I said, I have doctors, and they use sulfur-containing drugs, the sulfur grabs the pores and takes it out through the kidneys. They need to be monitored because if you do it too fast, you can have kidney damage from it. So the doctor has to know what they're doing. Patients will come in, they're doing it on their own. It scares me to death. They're using clays to clean out the gut, which is all of it's fine. They'll take a lot of chlorella, um, but they don't really know what their levels are. So I try to guide those patients and say, well, you know, you got a naturopath maybe helping them, um, but they never have really had their levels tested. And that, that kind of, I don't tell them it's wrong, but I try to say, well, you might not even need to be doing all this. You may be, you may be pretty low. And then you have others that go the full route with a medical MD and they do chelation, it's IV chelation, and the IV uh, has EDTA in it and it puts back minerals that are pulled off, but the EDTA pulls out arsenic and the lead. And then it's usually an oral medication that's gonna pull out the mercury. So but anyway, my advice in saying all that is you shouldn't be the one doing that, prescribing that. So it's outside of your license. Find somebody to work with to do that. All right, so dentists are responsible for putting 340 tons of mercury into the water supply every year. 
because um, it goes into, it goes out your sewer lines, it goes into the waste system, and then it goes, they don't do a really good job of getting it out of the water, and then it just goes back and recycles, and you drink it downstream. So our waters do contain some types of mercury because of us. Uh, so there are other, other sources of coal burning plants, but mostly all our coal burning power plants now have to have these big scrubbers on them that should be taking most of the mercury out of the air before it gets in the air. So dentists are the biggest polluters, and we haven't been required up until now to have separators uh, on our you know, on our lines, in between our chairs and our sewer lines, you got to have a dental separator now. So this goes back in your equipment room um, <clears throat> before your suction pump. And these are two types of separators. This one, I think, is the best separator on the market. Uh, we've got a scientific review on this that you can look up on our website, and it will tell you how this thing works. It's way beyond my little brain can handle but it does a very good job of capturing about 98% of the mercury. This one is probably a pretty good one too. It's been around a while and a uh, big thing may hold more, I'm not sure. I think you changed this part. But you need to have a mercury separator that can handle the capacity you're putting into it. And this one, we have a six chair practice, three, uh, three dentists, two of them take, taking out mercury. <laughs> I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> and, uh, we fill this thing up in about uh, a little over a year. So we change that out about once a year. 1,500 bucks or something like that. <clears throat> so like I said, it depends on how many chairs you're running, how many dentists are working in there, how much mercury you're taking out. If you got a real big, busy practice, get, get you a good size separator so you don't have to uh, change it all the time. <clears throat> so, Everybody in this room that works in a dental office is exposed to mercury. I don't care if you work at the front desk. You're going to have mercury exposure if you don't have things in place to clean up your environment, which I'm going to go over. Hygienist, when you polish a mercury filling, you are releasing vapor at a higher rate than if the patient's just sitting there. So my hygienist, I tell them, don't polish mercury. And even when you have a patient who still has mercury fillings and you're doing the polish, you put a mask on, a respirator mask. And even if you're not using dental mercury and placing them, which I doubt if anybody in here is, you still have to take out those fillings and that's your biggest exposure yet. Your biggest source when you do it. So this came out in like 1970. Uh, wait a minute, 76. And uh, this is from the American Dental Association's journal. They had this journal that every article in the journal was about mercury, occupational mercury exposure. They had an office, uh, a, a father and son's office that both of them got mercury poisoning, they called it, diagnosed. Went in, they had carpet in their office, it was really, really contaminated office, and they both got sick. Another office, uh, an employee left, got mad, came in and dumped mercury all over the office. So they had to come in and have that office cleaned up. That were two of the articles. Um, and then a couple of other articles about exposure while they were taking it out. So this was about the time that mercury was being encapsulated in, in, in the little capsules it comes in now. And so they came up with these recommendations, which are still the recommendations for today. They haven't changed any. So let's see what they say. You got to store mercury in unbreakable, tightly sealed containers. And they're talking about the mercury capsules. They're probably laying in a drawer in most offices. All operations involving mercury over areas that have impervious and suitably lipped surfaces so as to continue and facilitate recovery of spilled mercury or amalgam. A lot, of, a lot of offices have carpet. If you spill it, you got to clean it up immediately. And you're supposed to have actually a little kit in your office to do cleanup with. Use tightly closed capsules during amalgamation, which do not uh, work. I mean, when you triturate 
And the mild thing, you can, you can measure the mercury vapor just going sky high around it. It doesn't contain it. Use a no-touch technique for handling the amalgam because remember, people were using squeeze cloths and mixing this stuff by hand before we had these containers, capsules. You got to salvage all the amalgam scrap and store it under water. What happened in dental school? Where do those capsules go? Trash can right by the chair, right? <laughs> Did in my school. Work in well-ventilated spaces. Avoid carpeting dental operatories as decontamination is not possible. We, uh, I'll tell you that later. Eliminate the use of mercury containing solutions. I don't know what that is. Avoid heating the mercury. Use water spray and suction when grinding dental amalgam, which is all they say you need to do today. That's how most dentists operate. You compact it, perform yearly mercury determinations on all personnel, regularly employed dental offices. <laughs> yeah, right. Anybody do that? That's, that's expensive. Have periodic mercury vapor level determinations made in operatories. Does anybody do that? Now, you can do that. We do have a drone mercury vapor, the organization does, that we can rent to you if you want to go back and check your level. Say if you've got a lot of carpet or something in your office and you want to go rub your foot in that carpet and see how much mercury vapor you pick up, if you want to get that checked, you can. We do have a, an analyzer that is supposed to be able to rent. You're supposed to go over safety precautions with all your personnel. You're supposed to train them about the hazards of mercury vapor and the necessity for observing good mercury hygiene practices, which these are not. They didn't even mention a mask. And later on, somewhere in this article, they said, you know, we're wearing these cloth masks. Well, these cloth masks, which are designed to trap big, big particles, bacteria, these particulates of mercury are a lot smaller. They go right through the mask or they accumulate on the mask and release vapor, and you're just breathing a higher level of vapor. So those masks don't work. Okay. And these are some of the uh, measurements that we've done and or have been done and published of how much mercury vapor uh, comes when, like, you open up in the myelin capsule, 400 micrograms per meter cubed. Chairside traps. When you clean out those chairside traps, assistants, if y'all clean out the chairside traps, it's going to have mercury in it, and when you open that thing up, you can be exposed to as much as 600 micrograms. Remember, you're going to breathe that, and where's 80% of it going? To your lungs. 20% of it, you'll exhale. Drilling with no water spray, we did that in a, in a study, and we had to clear the room out. We went up to like 8,000. It was crazy. Um, when you're drilling with water and suction, it does keep it down, but you're still getting 50 to 40 micrograms, and we're going to show you a study in a minute how much particulate you can get. And polishing or doing a profi, you might get up to 900 micrograms. So you are constantly exposed in everything we do in dentistry, so you have to take precautions. You need to protect yourself. The largest source of mercury exposure to the practicing dentist is the removal of old amalgam fillings. You could release particulate and you release vapor when you do that. And if you, you can inhale the particulate, and the particulate will stay in your lungs a very, very long time. And it will continue to release mercury vapor as it's in your lungs. <clears throat> All right, I'll know a little bit about this study. In fact, if you want to ask questions about this study, we got people around here that can answer it, except David's not here. So this is a study that Dr. Warwick did. Dr. Warwick is, was the guy in the back setting up all this stuff in the t-shirt and shorts that looks like he's come out of Canadian woods somewhere. One of the smartest guys in the room. Probably if he was in the room, there he is. Dave? He is, uh, he might not look it, but I'm telling you, he's one of the smartest dentists I've ever met. Great guy. So Dr. Warwick, uh, a friend of ours, Dr. Young, who recently passed away, uh, this is Dr. Warwick's daughter. She works in his practice. And somehow my name got on this study. Because uh, I did very little about it anyway. I might have read it and talked about it, but I didn't do much of this research. The way we got to this research, we actually did a previous study. And in the previous study, we did it on mannequins. And we took out eight mercury fillings. 
and on a mannequin in the chair, and we had a body, fake body set up in the chair. And then we tested surfaces for particulate, same way every time. And we measured with instruments we had at, right at our mouths, breathing zone. We measured vapor, and then we measured vapor and particulate. And we took all these measures. We took all day doing it. We did it in an office I was moving out of. Before we did the study, I had a big teaching room when I used to teach CERIC stuff. And I had a big oriental rug in between two chairs because I had stopped teaching, so I'd put another chair on the other side. But big, big room, about as wide as this. Chair, two chairs and rug in the middle. And my daughter knew I was moving out. She wanted that rug. And I said, well, I don't know. I had to see if that rug was what's going on with that rug. So we tested the room first for contamination because we didn't want the room, we wanted to be, say we cleaned the room up and it wasn't previous mercury in it and stuff. That rug was contaminated with mercury. So we rolled it up, threw it in the dumpster. I was crying all the way because that was a $6,000 rug. <laughs> so she didn't get it. I didn't want my grandchildren crawling around on that. I wouldn't want my dog crawling around on that. So we had to throw away a pretty expensive rug. And the rest of the floors were hardwood they were solid but that we just had that rug in there because my wife's a designer so anyway so when we did that study we we had all our controls on which I'm gonna be going on and then we would take off a control in each segment and as we took off our controls every time the contamination went up the exposure went up the particulate went up the vapor went up but the key thing about that study was when we had all our controls on, there was still particulate being deposited on the patient's chest. On the, on the patient's chest, we got like 340 micrograms. On the assistant's knees, closest to the chair, her leg was getting covered up. So, if you don't have those surfaces protected, the patient's gonna walk out of your office after getting a couple of fillings done, mercury all over their chest, Drive to pick the kid up from daycare. Kid immediately is going to hug mama, bury their head in mama's chest, right? And get exposed to mercury. The assistant's been working for you all day, or you who's been working chair side all day, every time you take out a filling, you're depositing more mercury on your clothes. You're going to carry that home to your house, or you're just going to sit there and be exposed to mercury vapor all day. So that's why I'm getting ready to show you some very rigorous safety precautions. This is how serious this stuff is. So pay attention, don't take it lightly. So then that led to this study, because we couldn't get that other study published, because they said we didn't have enough data points. They want like 20 sets of data. We would have had to do 20 mercury fillings for every step of that. It would have taken us a week. We probably all would have died from mercury exposure. Not, not kidding, because we, we were... I will tell you that, um, when we got, we, we went down and we cut out eight fillings dry, no water. Mercury was going everywhere. I begged them to stop after four. I said, I'm going to be in this office two more weeks, guys. I got to be here. And you can see chunks of mercury everywhere. And the, the numbers just flew up. And the guy, the guy in the room, actually, that was from the mercury monitoring company. He actually said way back before, he said, I've never seen this high, this high of levels in industry. And this was before we were cutting dry. This is when we were cutting with water and suction. And so I've never seen numbers this high. So we took all of our pre protective gear and got out of that room, walked to the other side of my office, and we had the doors closed, to which was basically the hygiene side. I only had four chairs in that office. And walked over there, and there was a drone mercury vapor analyzer there. And I said, look, check this. Maybe we better check this room. We turned it on. It was sky high in that room. I said, I got a better idea. Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> we opened all the windows up, left all our suction units on to clean the air, and got out of there. And then came out the next morning, and all the levels were back down. It was scary. Very scary. So in this study, so we could get it published, what we did is we did 20 sets of data like they wanted, maybe a few more. And we wiped the head of the handpiece. We tested how much particulate was on the head of the handpiece. We wiped that, sent it off to the lab to analyze how much particulate was on the head of the handpiece. I just happen to have a copy of that study. I've even read it. <laughs> so 
So, we had numbers of mass particulate in micrograms. We had numbers from like 34, I don't know what happened to that one, up to 18,395 micrograms of mercury. That was taking out eight fillings. We took out 10 fillings on one person and we got 2,770 micrograms. And then we've got mercury vapor levels. One of the largest was 899. That went down to 815 minutes. 30 minutes it was down to 728. 60 minutes it went on down a little bit to 601. Uh, very, very large numbers we showed and had this published in Occupational uh, Health Journal, Journal of Occupational Medicine and Toxicology. So, and that was with all our protection measures on, because we were doing this on a live patient. So we didn't turn stuff off. We didn't do it like normal dentists do it. We did it with all our stuff on, with our high suction going, with our uh, special suction tips, we had rubber dams on, like I'm going to show you in a minute. All of that was on and we had these high levels. So our protective engineering controls do not protect you from exposure. There's still enough mercury particulate and vapor in the air that you have exposure. That's why you have to put on this protective gear and you have to cover up your patient and protect them. Now, <clears throat> I'm not in love with this slide. I told him to take it out. <laughs> but because this is good, I don't think this hairnet's too good. This is not really protective from mercury particulate. I don't want to see you in a hairnet. A surgical cap would be a lot better. But this is just going to let particulate get in your hair. And we got some exposed skin around the back of the neck. So this is not perfect. It's good but it's not the model I want to present to you, okay? Um, the patient's covered up. We've got a big high volume suction going. You can see there's a rubber dam in there, and we'll have better pictures of this in a minute, and I'll show you and go over everything that, you, that we want you to have. Some other papers, uh, Dr. Tom Duplinski, he's at, uh, he's at Yale, and he did a study that showed that dentists have higher levels of... Um, prescription meds in the normal population. And a lot of those pres prescription meds for neurological problems, depression, uh, arthritis, those kind of things that you would think would come from mercury. That we take more prescription meds than the general population. And we're sicker than the general population is what the study said. And he said after that paper that it would seem prudent to advise that dentists consider using restorations that do not contain mercury. That doesn't matter. They better consider protecting themselves when they're getting rid of people's mercury for them. That's where the exposure is coming from. And then this is another study by Dave's daughter. Uh, she did this study in dental school and she measured mercury, level, mercury vapor levels in their lab when they were practicing how to do amalgams. So, you know, in there they're doing, they don't have suction and stuff, water, and any kind of protection. And she, she showed increased levels of mercury and that they were high, very high levels of exposure to the students. And it came up, the conclusion was it's paramount that dental schools consider how dental students are trained in the subject of mercury hygiene when removing dental amalgam as well as other procedures where mercury exposure may occur. They must also train dental students in effective use of personal protective equipment in order to prevent occupational exposure to mercury while in dental school and in clinical practice. Uh, we don't have any dental schools doing that. Even the one where they did the study, I don't think. Calvary, do they do anything? Okay. All right. So. Additional occupational mercury research that you may, uh, that we have listed, you can go to our website and find tons of it. That uh, Casery in 2010, and those guys, they all found higher levels of mercury in dental workers than in the general population. And Gilbert and all those other guys looked at pregnancy, fertility, and gender specific risk to female dental workers and found they were all higher in female dental workers than in the general population, the risk were. 
NIGAB showed that dentists had increased skin hyperpigmentation, respiratory disorders, irregular pulse, hand tremors, spasms of the upper extremities, neuropsych symptoms, we're all crazy, tachycardia, painful chewing, thyroid enlargement, fears, and difficulty in writing. And then Mutter did show that neurological issues such as memory loss, concentration issues, fatigue, and sleep disturbances were higher in dentists than the general population. Ritchie looked at renal and memory issues, Echever, depression, and impaired visuomotor speed, higher in the dental population. So, how do we protect ourselves? Because <clears throat> you're going to take this stuff out, it's going to fail. Patients want it out. As you start protecting patients, they'll just want it out. Not because it's failing. They'll come into your office and say, I want my mercury fillings out. And you know, as the ADA would tell you, you to tell them to go somewhere else, and they're not supposed to do that. But that's what happens. They might want it out for cosmetic purposes, but usually it's because they want it out because it's mercury, and they don't feel good. So if you don't use safety measures, you're going to expose yourself because exposure is higher than, there is no, there, is, there are limits set for industry that have to use this stuff, and when those limits are exceeded, they have to close down the production line. There is no safe level of exposure. Like I said, in industry, they are wearing protective clothing and they're protecting their airways. You got to protect your patient because when you take it out, the patient's going to get a big hit of exposure. And then you get a chronic exposure all day long. The whole office can get contaminated. You need to clean the whole office out. Your front desk can get contaminated. It can be caused by the waste from the removal and storage of the amalgam. You need to store it and remove it, the protective clothing that you're going to have on. You've got to clean your instruments. You can get mercury vapor exposure from sterilization of instruments that have particulate all over them. You can get in your carpet if you have it. It can get on your drapes if you have it. It accumulates on your clothing if you're not covering your clothing up. And you can carry that stuff home on your shoes. How did that particulate get in that rug? In my office, it was not under the chair. It was away from the chairs. We tracked it on there. We walked it on there. So... We've been working, as an organization, we've been researching the danger since this organization started in 1984. Uh, we've done constant updates on the removal recommendations, and we, we increased the stringency of our recommendations based on some, those studies that were done, uh, and we renamed it SMART in 2016. We have a SMART certification. Everybody in this room can easily get SMART certified. Young lady over here, Dr. Adams. She just got her SMART certification last week. Go tell them. Ask her how easy it was. She also works for me. She's one of my associates. I'm very proud of her. And the SMART program also has a website that the public can go to. So your patients, the patients know what you're supposed to do, guys. The patients that are going to be coming to you, and if you don't do it, they may get up and leave. But they won't come back and they won't tell people about you. They'll call us, they'll call our office, and they'll go, you know that dentist was only, that I went to because it was on your website? He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. They're smart. So this is what you're supposed to do if you want to track these patients and if you want to be healthy. You think about this in kind of segments. What you do for your patients, what you do for your team and yourself, okay? And before, before we start, you can use a slurry of charcoal, chlorella, or similar absorbent paste to rinse and swallow before the procedure. We use a, what we use? N-acetylcholine and vitamin C. We make up a, a mixture of that and we have them drink that after the procedure, rinse their mouth out good and not swallow it. What you do after the procedure, you don't want them to swallow. You can do this swallow and get some protection. Uh, there's also some products from Quicksilver Scientific that's designed to protect the patient during the procedures, and we use that product too. It's, uh, it's called Merc Out or something like that now. They changed the name. So you can go onto their website. They may be here at the meeting too. Um, 
So that's another product you can use. You want to use a full body, impermeable barrier, as well as full head, face, neck barrier under and around the dam. That's a patient right there, guys. That's the mouth. You don't see anything else on the patient. That's proper protection. Underneath the rubber dam, you might want to stick a few cotton rolls, like in the buckle fold, because the rubber dam's not perfect. Particles can get under there, and that, the cotton rolls can trap the particles. Um, external air or oxygen is delivered via nasal mask for the patient or a nasal can cannula completely covered with a barrier. This patient's got a cannula under there breathing oxygen so they're not breathing the room air. You, do, you want to ask them, don't breathe through your mouth. So we, we use uh, just a mask like you find on a nitrous unit. In fact, we use our nitrous machine and just use the oxygen permit and let them breathe oxygen while they're doing it. Fleet protection. This is a high volume suction. Uh, it has a, a charcoal based, activated charcoal filter in it. It's going to trap the vapor as much particulate, but it doesn't get it all because we found particulate being deposited right here on the patient's chest when we did our studies in pretty big amounts. Uh, so that's why we went to covering these people up and giving them full protection. Any questions on that? Yes. The charcoal? Oh, this the charcoal will bind mercury. So, um, and it's not, it's not harmful. So it, it, the purpose of it is to get it in the gut so that any vapor or any particulate that's swallowed or gets past these barriers, it will grab it in the gut. The Quicksilver products do the same thing, okay? And we actually, we actually put them on the Quicksilver products and let them start it a couple of days before, and they can do it a couple of days after. And actually, if they do the whole thing, they'll start dumping mercury from their body. They'll clean their guts up, okay? But I'm not chelating them. <laughs> I'm protecting them, okay? All right. You got your dental dam. Um, there's a saliva ejector put under the dam trying to pull vapor out that can get through that dam. The vinyl dams, vapor goes through a lot less than a, than a latex dam. So that's why we use the vinyl or whatever they're called, the non-latex ones, whatever they're made out of. Uh, this is a cleanup. It's attached to a high volume suction and it has a little fence that goes around and it helps block a lot of particulate. Uh, when we did our study and we took that thing off, we were surprised at how much difference we found more particulate when we took that off. They're a little tough to use. Um, you can trim them. you got a rubber dam clamp in the way. They're, they're, sometimes they're a little long down here. You can just cut a little bit of that off to make it fit the tooth better. This is one of those things that's a pain in your ear. It's one of those things that will be hard to get used to, that you're not going to want to do. I'm telling you, they work. Do it. Okay. Then the vacuum's in there, that big vacuum, close to the operating field. Um, and you see, we're not, they say preferred, I say use the damn thing. Okay, in the slides. It's very important to use that. Lots of water coming out, turn that water up, blow that mercury up, suction, get it out of the, keep it wet so it goes in the suction, it helps. Take them out as big a pieces as you can. Uh, I love it when you go through the amalgam and two pieces fall out. I mean, that's the best scenario you can have. And then after removal, you need to clean up the patient's mouth. You can use, again, the same charcoal slurry that you make and don't let them swallow that. Or you can use an acetylcysteine in vitamin C. The cysteine group will grab mercury. Um, and you can use that. But don't let them swallow. You need, as dentists, and staff protection. You've got to have protective gowns and covers for the dentist and any dental personnel that's in the room. Really, nobody should be in the room that doesn't need to be in there. Non-latex nitrile gloves have been shown to be more impervious to the vapor in particulate. And then you need face shields. Your hair and head should be covered for the dentist and person, the dental personnel. So these masks... I'm not talking about little cloth masks that we use to keep them getting a cold. We're talking about a respiratory mask that has a, some kind of filter on it to trap particulate and vapor. 
And this is a one that just goes over the nose and mouth. This is one that covers the whole face. Um, these you can wear loops with, these you can't wear loops with. I prefer this one because it's more comfortable. Uh, we have them both in the office. Um, or you can use this mask, which is like a cloth mask, but it has uh, some filters on it that trap the mercury stuff. But with this mask, you still need to use one of those plastic face shields that flip down. And we have all three of these. I think we're still selling them, but we should have some in our booth tomorrow that you can see, maybe try on to get sizes. And this you can start Monday morning when you get back to work. And even when you're cleaning out, well, the dentists probably aren't, but even when your employees are cleaning out the suction traps, you saw that slide where you release 600 micrograms of mercury when you open up that little chair side trap, you should have your mask on. And you should have the big, big evacuator air filter running. We bring it over right by the trap, turn it on, put a mask on, have our gloves on, take that out. We have our mercury bucket that we recycle in the room open that up, throw it in there, and close everything up to try to keep exposure down as much as possible. You need an amalgam separator that's law now, properly installed and maintained. The high volume air filtration systems like IQ Air, Dent Vac, Flex Vac, or similar devices, we should have some of these on, uh, exhibitors on the floor. They cost anywhere from, say, a thousand to $3,500, depending on what you want to get. If you can open your windows, open your windows. Um, we don't have many federal, state, and local regulations where I'm from. I'm all about Canada. And discarding the clothing and the protective garments is kind of an issue because we're throwing ours in the trash and they're going to the dump. I don't really know how much is on there. The rubber dam, the really heavily contaminated stuff, it goes into a bucket that gets recycled. It has a lid on it. When it gets full, we send that off to a, re to a recycler. So the issue of what to do with all this clothing is an issue. We probably shouldn't really be throwing it in the trash. So I am too, we encourage you to have a conversation with your patients about this removal procedure. My patients, I've got a little spoiled because my patients come to us because we do this. They already know what we're going to be doing. There's stuff on the website that most of them have seen it. Occasionally there's a husband that a wife sent in and he doesn't have a clue. But his wife said, you come get this mercury out and we have to explain it all to him. But when I first started doing this and I was just doing, I was wearing a mask and that was about it and putting rubber down on the patient and letting him breathe some oxygen back then. I would tell the patients, I say, look, I, we've learned, I've learned that this mercury in your teeth is very dangerous and we have a high rate of exposure when I'm taking it out. I'm going to protect myself. Do you mind if I protect you? Oh, no, please do protect me. They didn't say, oh, no, you can't protect me. Don't protect me. You know? And we have it in our minds that we do something different. The patient's not going to like it. And they like this, so they like it enough we charge them for it. I mean, we have a fee, a protection fee, to cover our costs and make a little money on it. So they very rarely say, I'm going down the road and get mine done and get get completely filled up with mercury. Some husbands do. And we got a checklist on our website that you can go through and check all this stuff off. I know many dentists are not doing um, mercury anyway and you're doing composites and that's fine. And there are BPA free composites out there now. Uh, those are Boco products like Admir Fusion and Fusion Extra um, that are touted as being the first purely ceramic based restorative material. So they, they bond together a little bit different and they don't have the bisphenol A's in them. So that's what we use for our composites. And I, I've never used uh, glass ionomers and Compromers that have fluoride in it. We just, you know, if they have fluoride in it, we don't like that leaking out. So we just avoid any fluoride containing restored material. And those those composites do not have fluoride in it. 
You can do biocompatibility bio testing. Um, and remember that you, you, as a dental licensee, you're not supposed to tell the patient they have mercury poisoning. You can guide them to a proper health official again and get screened. You can do a Quicksilver test for them. That's a screening test to pre-screen them if you need to or want to. And sign up for the SMART process. Get that done first. Then you can do accreditation. And we have fellowship levels and mastership levels of, of recognition in the academy. So that website is really good. A lot of scientific data on there. If you want to be the best, go back and do this stuff. Because if you don't do this stuff, you're not doing what you should be doing. You're not protecting yourself, your patient, or your employees. About half my team will be here tomorrow for the meeting. I encourage y'all to drain their brains. They are a smart group. They will tell you how you can do this, how it's possible. It's not scary. You got to spend a little money. You could literally be doing this as soon as you get the equipment in you need. If you have to go borrow $5,000, go borrow $5,000. Charge your patience, get it back. It's been an honor to speak to y'all. Thank you.